ladies and gentlemen. This is another edition of the MSP Initiative. MSP Talk, it is April 11th. We are well into Q2. Did you know that? Are you paying attention? Hopefully everybody's hitting their numbers out there. Probably not. Um, we're going to get through the housekeeping like we normally do at the beginning of every one of these sessions, and then we'll get into the good stuff. So here we go. MSPinitiative.com. This is you know, pretty much what we do here. So you're going to see this very session being recorded. will be uploaded to our podcatchers and YouTube and the sessions tab of the MSPinitiative.com website. So follow, share, like comment uh we 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 appreciate it we have our educational event coming up next week in nashville or nash vegas some people like to say so april 17th and 18th in nashville we have a ton of msps hopefully like the people that are listening to this uh session who are going to be on panels those are the beginning part of the days at these this two-day event and then we have industry experts who are doing at least two hour workshops with you, right? Like we want to stop doing death by PowerPoint. We want you to actually walk away with something actionable. So instead of the idea that you should look into something, we're talking about actually the steps required to do something. Uh, that that being said, you can see the schedules listed April 17th and 18th on the uh, Community Minds tab of MSPinitiative.com. Check it out. Best part about this event. As an MSP, it costs you absolutely nothing to register. There is no $399, $499, uh fee. So you can click on here, register for Nashville, and I'll take you to a page where you can just register. You do have to get there. I appreciate that. There's time out of the office and like a little bit of travel probably for some of you. But we're hoping that this is like a straight up educational event that you can actually benefit from and not like, you know, breakout sessions where I'm trying to sell you something. I'm going to sell you education. And then you decide if that education works for you. So there it is, MSP Community Minds. Then we get into probably what we're more famous for here at MSP Initiative, our MSP Community Block Parties, After Parties, Nighttime Parties, Party Parties. So two of them coming up, uh, one at both in the same week, interestingly enough. One will be, uh, it is the week of June 9th. So that's the Sunday, right? That week. Um, we have PAX A Beyond in Denver. Uh, so we'll be doing a block party uh, with on the 10th, uh, which is the second night of the event. And then we will be doing a block party with the Datacon Kaseya event in Dublin. So I guess it depends which side of the uh, ocean you're, you're, you're coming from. Uh, but we will be uh, doing two parties on the same week. And man, we just love, we love the party with you. So uh, definitely click on these, register ahead of time. It costs absolutely nothing as an MSP to join us. So again, like we're just giving you a bunch of free stuff. Take advantage. Uh, and we will uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing you guys out at those two events. Uh, we have some MSP industry offers from people who have thrown out some deals. If you can take advantage of them, super. And lastly is our industry calendar that we spend a ton of time on trying to consolidate all the things that we th know about going on in the, uh, in the sandbox. So if you really want to be on the road all week, every week, every month, you can do it. I don't know if you're going to make any money while you're out and about, but. Uh, plenty of events for you to go to. So that is the housekeeping MSPinitiative.com. So today, our special guest, and for the first time ever on uh, the show, uh, Victor Lopez from a company called FlexPoint. How are you doing today, Victor? I'm uh, good, George. How are you? How's it going? Yeah, you know, like we're, we, I, I, you know, we're kind of chatting right before we jumped on. Yes, I'm definitely from Philadelphia. There's no question about it. You don't. No have question. No mind. doubt. No doubt in everyone's mind. Yeah. Exactly. No, Wrestle, Re WrestleMania was in Philadelphia. And for people who aren't, you know, watching, you know, WWE, you know, and there's the most time. recent one was. Yes. Shut up. Really? Oh, yeah, I didn't know. Last that. weekend, so yeah. it was like a couple hundred thousand people coming through Philadelphia. Like it's their Super Bowl, right? It's the yeah. professional yeah. wrestling Super Bowl. So. Uh, it was good. It was nice to see everybody out and about. I got a chance to go into, you know, my building, the Philadelphia Eagles home stadium and see mm -hmm. it in a slightly different way in a different format. Yeah. Uh, and I, I grew up in the, you know, rock stone cold, you know, yeah. I know. I was going to say, I, I, I think I, I vividly remember the first wrestling match I ever watched. It was like 1994, uh, on TV. And then, but it, it really kind of tapered off probably in like the early 2000s so it's actually news to me that uh you know wrestlemania is still going so uh they, you know, they, they had you like something new every day. Lar the largest ever the most people ever the most viewers wow. ever the most social media posts that's ever. incredible 
that's yeah. incredible when you think about like other sports right like like i'm a huge baseball fan and like yeah. people always talk about baseball as being like a dying sport like only like old people or like you know people our age like baseball but it's like how did uh how did wrestling stay relevant with like you know especially in like the cell phone like internet age I i'll tell you what the rock came back that's my guy okay and, like, yeah even though he was off doing movies forever and ever and ever, like, you know, I think I saw a post online where it was like, when I see The Rock, I just see Maui from Moana, the Disney movie. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I don't see the pro wrestler. I, I still see the pro wrestler. Uh, it was awesome. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I feel quasi bad because one of the nights of WrestleMania, like, it was kind of colder. And if you didn't have layers and, like, as people who go to Eagles games all year long, yeah. like, yeah. during the city season, we're ready for oh, that. Oh, it's so, outdoors, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's outdoors. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> I think like one night they had like like seventy two thousand five hundred. The next night they had like seventy two thousand eight hundred, and then they also had um, seventy two thousand. Yes, mm -hmm. oh, that's a so huge. They also, had, they also had SmackDown on Raw beginning and after. So when yeah. you add together, it's pretty pretty crazy. But um, wow. just cool wow. cool to see uh, cool to see the uh, the backyard highlighted on uh, on TV. Uh, yeah, I bet. Uh, I, bet. I missed the second night. I flew to Denver to uh, scope out some venues for our block party uh, yeah. that's up here. Uh, yeah, I feel like anytime I open up LinkedIn, I see like George is going somewhere. George or Alec is going somewhere on a map somewhere far. <laughs> you know, uh, I, as I've said to many people, right, it's uh, the benefits of traveling. There's many. We can talk about all the cool stories. But for people who do it on a regular basis, and if you're not, like not mentally in the right place it can also wear on you too right so yeah, there's a yeah. good and a bad to all things but uh don't worry we love to be out and about even ask jen in the background we, we yeah. set her places too she loves it yeah. especially no, when she I, gets I mean I, i'm uh you know i mean i'm on uh, at a show probably at least once once a month myself so uh not not as bad as probably you guys but like yeah definitely but i mean there's no better way right like there's no better way to like i tell this to anyone like what better way to like see um your people and like who you're trying to serve than like at a show where you can like actually talk to them right like physical thing it's just it's like uh it's almost like a like a uh you know different thing now being able to see people face to face and like talk to them and a good thing to be totally honest yeah, yeah for sure uh so so anyway um victor for people who have never met you before don't know your story i always ask anyone that new onto the show like Hey, just kind of tell us your your journey, right? Like you started somewhere, you made it to you know into MSP IT land. Like, mm -hmm. what did that look like? Yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's actually uh, I mean, for most, right? It's probably it's probably a long and windy road to 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 get to Magic Land, the IT channel. But for me, it, it was a little a little odd and interesting. So I actually um, I actually started my career as a lawyer. So um, I went to oh. law school. Yeah, yeah. So fun, fun fact. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I recently I did. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I actually went to law school. Um, you know, it's one of those things you go to college and you're like, ah, I don't really know what I want to do. So I, I majored in philosophy. So as you can imagine, all the jobs available to people who major in philosophy, right? And so logical step for me was like, I'm going to, yeah, yeah, exactly. Keep counting. There's, there's not that many. Um, Starbucks barista, I think was number one on the list at the time. Um, wow. <laughs> no, the baristas out there, right? Oh, by uh, the way, let me pause. Let me pause. Yeah, well, yeah. Since a lot of people know that we travel, I had forwarded my colleague, Mr. Sanders, a, uh, a, a, um, a reel this morning. If you are a Delta person mm -hmm. and you're also a Starbucks frequenter, I'm sure Jen already has this. So done. You can link your account. So every time you go to Starbucks, you get Delta rewards for Oh, no way. Oh, that's good oh, to know. So there you yeah. go. I had, I had yeah. to give that freebie out there for all of you travelers. No, everyone, everyone knows, yeah. So anyway, so I went to law school. Uh, and so I started my career as a, as an attorney um, doing primarily private equity M&A. So uh, wow. that was fun. Uh, I did that. I, I like to tell people I was in law school for more time than I was uh, practicing law. So as you can imagine, it was, uh, it was a fun experience. But from there, I uh, actually transitioned over into finance. So I spent close to six years at a place called um, Blue Owl Capital, which is a um, $150 billion investment fund. Um, so we did a ton of different things, but primarily invested in small and middle market businesses. So 
across the board, not just MSPs, but actually a ton of software yeah. vendors that serve MSPs. So ConnectWise, for example. Um, and so I did that for for a good a good while. Um, and actually myself and my co-founder Sam, um, who I met there, we spent a lot of time just, you know, understanding the MSP space. It was yeah. actually a lot of how we met made our original relationships in the space got to meet people you know like adam sluskin who you know been at uh connectwise for a very long time and mm -hmm. so um over time you started to uh when you're in that role you start to identify areas you know gaps in the market areas where something isn't currently solving a problem right right and so for us what we were looking at at the time was when you look at an MSP, when you look at an IT service company, right? Generally speaking, I'm using generalities here. Generally speaking, those are started by people that are extremely, extremely good at providing IT services. So technical yeah. people, right? Really good at either being in-house IT or working at another MSP. Agreed. When they go into starting an MSP, and you, you've lived this journey, George, so tell me if I'm wrong here. Um, <laughs> But when they go into starting MSP, right, like a lot oftentimes, right, especially the ones that are successful, it's like they sort of stumble into this business, right? It's like, oh, I was I was out here to like help people with their IT and, you know, sort of do this thing that I'm really good at. And all of a sudden um, you fall into, well, now I'm running a business. Now I'm running a business. And now, you know, I realize all the all the challenges that come um, with running a business and especially, you know, a service-based people business, right? And so for us, we saw, you know, a huge gap in tools and software to help these business owners, these uh, accidental business owners in a lot of ways, um, help run their businesses. And so the first thing that we sort of identified was, well, there's payments, right? There's traditional accounts receivable, how do you receive your payments? How do you get paid? Making sure you actually get paid. You know, we, we talk about this all the time. Like cash flow is the lifeblood, the oxygen of any business, right? And then um, on top of that, we also realize that um, there's this, you know, interesting thing in the MSP space where uh, so many MSPs are in the business of providing credit to their clients. And so we thought, wow, that's 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 really interesting. You know, you have all these thousands and thousands of mini banks. I don't know if that's formally providing credit. I think oh, they just yeah. turn it into I, I think you probably realize the sarcasm there, but um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so obviously not intentionally. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so we set out to build a solution that essentially helps MSPs run their business primarily through automating their accounts receivable from billing, invoicing, payment. Um, and also very importantly, helping them not be a bank. So you'll hear me talk about that a lot, but um, no longer be a credit provider, be a, you know, IT service provider. Okay. Let me, let me go backwards for a second. Cause we're going to yep. get into you know, flex point and what you guys do. Um, so you sat in a very interesting chair that a lot of people on the MSP side of the aisle just, I mean, imagine the stories in the comments and the Reddit threads on, on this topic, right? VCP. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't like you. I'm not trying to point you, you know, just general industry, okay? Don't take it personally. A lot of people don't like those guys. A lot of people think that they're kind of, like they're forcing change in a negative way, right? To the to the program, right? To the system, to the sandbox. Um, From a vendor standpoint, they feel like once that, transaction that event occurs like innovation stops and like yeah. you now like things just slow down and maybe like access to the resources they had start to disappear mm -hmm. from an msp perspective we're seeing i forget how many there are let's say 20 to 25 recognizable platform msps yeah. have been mm -hmm. invested in by the same group of people you know same type of investor who are like literally rolling up msps right as much right. as they can right yeah so and they don't like that. You yeah. know, like a lot of people don't like it. I'm sure like the people who get a check out of it probably do. Somebody's <laughs> making any money out of this. Yeah. But yeah. that being said, like, you know, there. I guess the point I'm trying to make is from somebody that sat on the money man side, right? On the mm -hmm. investor side. 
I'm curious how you saw how you see the world right through your glasses. Yeah. And right? I'm curious, yeah. like some of the decision making that's made. We we speculate, right? How do you how did you decide that this was a good investment? And what is your hundred day plan post acquisition to get what you need out of it versus right. what's been happening? So like, if you were to like give me a big picture, right? Like from your yeah, yeah yeah. So I'll break I'll break it down into two parts, right? So like first, I'll I'll talk a little bit about I think the the first part you mentioned, which I think is like very top of mind for most people it's not just msp right it's like how private equity is affecting all our lives right like i was i was uh telling my wife this the other day is like you know i was looking for a brand of deodorant right just something like a brand of deodorant um and she was like oh why don't you buy toms of maine right it's this like crunchy granola brand and then little did you know it's owned by some like big conglomerate right you thought it's yeah. just like so eventually, right, you unwrap everything and everything is either, you know, made in China or owned by a private equity firm, right? <laughs> so, so talking about that point, but so, so, so focusing on that part of it, and then I'll get to the the second part of your question, but, um, you know, I think there, there's always two sides to, to everything. Nothing's ever black and white, right? So I think the, the private equity and, and just to be clear, I'm not here to sort of defend it or anything that it's done, right? So I just give you my perspective and my experience. Um, I think part of the success, a, a big contribution to the success of this country, everything that we do here is because we are driven by innovation, right? So, and sure. in order to innovate, oftentimes you need capital, right? And yeah. so um, I think one of the big positives that has come out of the industry is, you know, that capital to drive innovation. So I think that's definitely something that people um, tend to overlook. And at the same time, the other part to it is like, who are investors in private equity firms, right? So it's not you and I, right? Or maybe it is, George, I, it's, it's definitely not me, but it, it's primarily pension plans, state pension plans, right? Like all the people, public works, right? You look at like the state of Pennsylvania or the state of New Jersey or state, like some of the largest investors in private equity funds. Wow. And I don't do think people do? know that, to be honest. I, I think it's a common misconception. It's a, I mean, it's you, you, this is all public. You can look it up. Like, um, I think it's called PSERS, like the Pennsylvania State Employee Retirement Fund is one of the largest private equity investors, right? And wow. why do they do it? They do it to fund the pension plans for like the firefighters, the nurses, everyone else. So there's that whole side of it, right? It's like this uncomfortable relationship of between the the blue collar, the you know, the state employees who have their pensions with these funds that require you know some level of return um, to to be able to 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 support that. So um, I think putting all that aside, I think part of why um, we at FlexPoint saw an opportunity was because, frankly, we saw from the inside, what it looks like to, especially on the vendor side, the ramifications and what that looks like when, you know, these vendors are bought by large private equity firms. And so everyone has, right, like every MSP owner will probably tell you, like, my goal is to one day sell this business and make a lot of money for me and my family. Um, that's just being an entrepreneur, right? Like, that's just the reality of it. And so I think um, that's, that's, part of the challenge is this uncomfortable um, challenge and this uncomfortable dynamic between, yes, everyone, we all are striving for this opportunity, this exit where, you know, we're all, you know, live the, the, the entrepreneurial dream, but at the same time, we're all, you know, talking about the outcome. What, what does that mean for, for everyone else? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's a challenge. I mean, I think for us, we, at FlexPoint specifically, we think of it as an opportunity, frankly, we we continuously innovate. We listen to our partners. We make um, the changes that you request. Which, when you know you're a much larger company and you have private equity owners, let's just be honest. Like the the focus is something else, right? It's not yeah. it's not so much um, yeah. how can you um, deliver the best product to your customers. It's how can you deliver the best product that's extremely profitable. So, um, so yeah, so I'll get off my soapbox there, but just to maybe hit on the second part of your question. I mean, I think it, it, it focusing on the MSP space, right. And I think what's happened 
in the really the last five years, right? And there's so many more intelligent people that can talk about this than, than I can. But I think what's happened in the last five years is you just have so much capital, so much capital, and they don't know what to do with it, right? Like they being the investment funds, the private equity firms. And so they're all chasing this special MSP that the reality of it, it's probably like less than 10% of the total market of what an MSP is, right? So it has to be of a certain size, doing certain EBITDA, has to be like, you know, certain types of clients, et cetera. And so I think what that's done is if you talk to almost any MSP, right? Like even an MSP that's just getting started, moving from break fix to managed service, um, everyone's focused on like, well, how can I get my business to fit into that mold of, you know, the type of business that a private equity wants to support? So like everyone's talking about like EBITDA when I think you should probably be talking about, well, like, do you actually have managed service clients? Is your model managed service? Is it break effects, right? Um, and so I think what's happened is the the upstream effect. You have all this capital that's trying to find this very limited number of MSPs that fit this mold mm-hmm. has then, you know, had a sizable impact on the whole market in a lot of good ways, right? Because it's a good thing that people now care about their margins. It's a good thing that people care about their EBITDA and, you know, some of these other operational aspects and part of what, you know, we try to help people with as well. Um, but the reality is, you know, it, it's very, very early days in that. So, I, I mean, you talked about some of these platforms, but some of these platforms have only existed for, you know, less than five years. So I don't think we've seen, right, the true outcomes there or what the true um, reality would be um, sort of post acquisition of those. Yeah. Well, one thing's for sure. Um Every deal is a little bit different. I have talked to a lot of people who have gone through buy or sell side of something, right? Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. I was actually talking to an MSP yesterday who, you know, was you know asking me things about valuation and how how do you come to the proper valuation? I'm like, a lot of it is correctly categorizing your revenue, right? Like, is it you know like maybe times have changed, right? Because the market always changes up and down every all, all, all you know all year every year. Um, but SaaS companies were usually valued differently than a professional services company, right? Like, is it still true in your mind that a SaaS company is valued more on growth, top line reoccurring revenue, and churn percentage generally mm-hmm. than, than the bottom line of an MSP's calculation, which is more EBITDA? Is that still generally true or has it been more grayed out? I think... I think it depends. So I, I think it depends. And I'll tell you kind of how we thought about things and sort of what I think is pretty common these days. So um, if, if you have a software company that's growing 200, 300, 400% year over year, the focus is 100% going to be on revenue, top line revenue. And the reason for that, right, is the growth rate, right? Because the, the balance, and you'll hear this from most financial type investors, the balance is between investing in growth versus investing in profitability, right? So if you spend a ton of money into sales and marketing, you should be growing very rapidly. Right. Now, if you scale back the money that you're spending on sales and marketing, your growth rate is probably going to go down, but your profitability is probably going to go up, right? Yeah. So it's that balance of at what stage does it make sense? So when you look at most um, like later stage software companies when they go public, right? They're generating over $100 million of revenue, but their growth rate generally tends to come down into like the, the regular people atmosphere, right? Sub 100%. Um, and so that's that's always going to be the case, right? Like people, investors, anyone is always going to pay an additional amount for that growth, right? Um, I think the more common... Um, scenario is um, valuation based on uh, profitability multiples, in this case, EBITDA. And so um, I think um, there was a period of time where it was very hot. And I think some investors probably looked at MSPs and were like, all right, they have, you know, X amount of revenue, I'm going to value them at eight to 10 times 
that multiple. Um, I, I would say that's probably not that common um, and was probably was the best probably don't really exist anymore. <laughs> probably had some bad uh, bad bets there. So I, I think what is much more common is a multiple of EBITDA, right? So it's, it's a multiple of this metric that essentially just measures profitability and cash flow. Um, and so um, for most service-based businesses and most businesses generally, it doesn't matter if they're software or um, an MSP, right? Like that's going to be the metric that they're measured on. Um, and then things come into play like, okay, how much of that revenue is recurring? How much of it is tied to a managed service contract? How much of it is low margin, you know, hardware reselling, et cetera. Got it. So regardless of SaaS company or MSP, the starting point is the same is what you're saying, right? That they're going to work backwards. So, yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't, the, 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 diff, the key difference though, is like at those early stages, right? Like you might be an MSP, let's say in your first year, um, and you're doing 500 K, right? 500 K you have a good first year. That's you're just getting started. Um, and you grow 200%, right? Like the next year you're doing, you know, much more than that. I don't think most, and again, I could be wrong. I'm not, the expert in this um the most likely you're not going to get a revenue multiple right even though you grow because you went from five hundred thousand to two million dollars right but if you're a software company that goes from a million dollars to ten million dollars of revenue and you're growing right you're growing at that rapid pace you're probably going to get um a multiple based on on revenue okay there it is guys you heard it from somebody that was behind the, the glass on the other side so you know 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 your numbers so that yeah. you understand what you're working towards. And the last thing I want to do, and we've heard this on this show, right? You work for 20, 30 years. In your head, you think you know what's going on. You get to the point where you're ready to do something. You find out, not good. <laughs> you're not yeah. good. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 definitely a process. I mean, I think, I think in general, from my experience, every successful MSP that has had an exit has spent at least two to three years kind of preparing for that. And so not just from like an operational standpoint, but from like, you know, making sure your employees understand that that's part of your plan, right? Like I think the worst case scenario is, <clears throat> you know, the MSP owner that sells the business for, you know, this awesome number um, and there's a huge earn out tied to it. And then the next day, all the employees, including, you know, the G GM and all the important key people are like, well, you didn't tell us this, I quit. Right. And they're off and go somewhere else. And now that business is because it's a people business at the end of the day, right? Service based business. Sure. So um yeah, sure. so that 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 becomes a challenge. And I think that's a challenge for a lot of MSPs, especially MSPs that are in that sort of range of, you know, one to ten million. It's just do you have a team, an executive team that surrounds you so that, you know, if you go on the street, get hit by a taxi, the business still runs, right? And it still runs um without very little interruption yep jen's gonna take over when i disappear <laughs> uh, <laughs> she's like what did he just say um <laughs> let's flip let's flip over into flex point so like let's look at the market for a second right you came into a market with a handful of options two of the most notable one have been acquired by the platform software companies mm -hmm. right you know bng connect booster who got acquired by the Kaseya group and then you yep. had Wise Sync out of Australia that was acquired by um, ConnectWise. Yep. And then they're, you know, listen, there's still, you know, like the gateway services that every bank offers, right? You know, like authorized.net and, and you know, the credit card merchant yep. processing and ACH, yada, yada, yada. And then there's companies out there that are a little bit more ubiquitous, right? Like a bill.com or, or something yep. like that, right? They're out there. Yep. And then there's good old fashioned QuickBooks merchant services, yep. uh, which I'm surprised still is a thing, but apparently yep. it is. So, you know, so when you, Lay those options out there. Let's say that there was like five options mm -hmm. other than good old fashioned checks and the check scanner machine or the mail, right? right. So as all things go, and, and you've been on the other side of this, when people get gobbled up and the terms change, people look look elsewhere. Fine. Right. So like other, yeah, you know, so so based on those options, you came in and you said, Hey, I'm gonna create a sixth option. I, you know, I, there's probably more, but like I'm gonna create mm -hmm. a sixth lane. And what is the value that that we're going to provide in this lane that, you know, differently? So 
I think I, I think the best way to kind of describe this, right? It's it's where we are today versus where we'll be a year from now, right? So I think I think it's a, a very accurate comparison to say, you know, and I think frankly, the Connect Boosters and the Wise Pays of the world have done a great job, right? Like they've done a great service to the market. In the last 10 years, they've provided something that I don't know, five, seven years ago, most people didn't either know that they needed or didn't have a solution to solve that problem, right? 100% so, true. Yeah. Totally, totally transparent there that I think they've done a tremendous job. And so when we think about ourselves and why why we started FlexPoint, right? And what we think the differentiating value proposition really is, is like, yes, today we can essentially do everything that, you know, a Connect Booster or a Wise Pay provides with a little bit more. Um, but again, going back to what you were saying, right? Like those businesses have reached what I would say a peak, right? Like they, they are now part of a large organization. They're tied to those businesses. And so for us, what we're doing today is just the beginning, right? And so really for us, it goes back to what I was talking about earlier and why, you know, I left this career in finance to start FlexPoint. For us, it's really building a suite of financial tools for an MSP. So payments okay. is part of it. It's a big part of it, right? But even from the beginning, right? Like we're not just doing payments. We're also helping with short-term financing, helping um, MSPs not be a bank. And so from there, we have a lot of other incredible things that we're working on, constantly developing, innovating. So I think the value proposition today is very clear. I think most people understand the need for accounts receivable software, payment software, making sure it works within your existing workflow, so it integrates into your PSA and your accounting software. So, I mean, we can talk about the authorized .NETs of the world, but I think, you know, if you're using that, you probably have some other issues that you need to solve for first. Well, I, um, I, saw, I saw a post of a guy yesterday, I forget where, one of the groups on one of the platforms, Facebook, whatever. Yeah. And he said that authorized.net, this so far this year has held up $100,000 of transactions that they had to go and get released, basically, right? right. Like mm -hmm. they transacted the customer, came out of their account and went into limbo. Yeah. And they had yeah. to fight to get the money released. And it's like, wait a minute, why, why is this so difficult? Yeah, I mean, we. Uh, I'll give you an example. We had a, we had a partner who who joined FlexPoint after using PayPal, and they were using PayPal, and okay. they were paying uh, an obscene amount of money using yeah. PayPal just for yeah. the the benefit of using PayPal. So, so anyway, so so yeah, so the, the so the way kind of to to get back to your question, just kind of summarize there is yes, today our solution is very much focused on providing payments, automating your payments, automating the working capital side of it. But that's just where we are today. And we're, we're, we're a fairly new business. You know, we've been around for two years. So I think what we've accomplished in those two years, right, we have hundreds of MSP partners at this point now. Um, it's only the beginning. So I think when you look at where we're going and, you know, what we're planning on doing in so, a year so paint, from now. Paint. Paint the picture for can can you can you share yeah, what is like yeah absolutely. I'll, I'll share what I can uh, yeah. otherwise someone someone on my uh, engineering team is gonna get really mad at me but so um so we think of it as a full cycle right so there's the accounts receivable side which is what we're solving for now um but in terms of running your business as an MSP we we focus on a few other key areas so reporting being able to have accurate data around things like DSO accounts receivable aging, um, but also forecasting. So taking it a step further, like how do you take that information and be able to forecast it in an efficient way so that, you know, we, we talk about this very often, but you have um, a lot of people, a lot of businesses, not just MSPs, small businesses generally, that live by the bank statement, right? Like you don't know that you're running out of money until you see the bank statement. That, yeah. that should never sure. be the case, right? You should have reporting, you should be able to forecast, you should know what your cash flow coming in, going out looks like. So that's an area that we think um, is, you know, very, uh, very important to focus on. But then as we think further, right, then there's the the accounts payable side of things. How do you handle the other side of um, sort of the, 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 the payment workflows? 
and then beyond that into a full suite of, of um, tools. Like even think about, I mean, now we're getting a little bit into the future, but um, even think about how most people deal with things like payroll, right? So it's like, how do you get the your text time, right? And and all the all the time and information that they're putting into the PSA, how do you get that accurately into your payroll system so that you know how everything is, you know, works together? So I think there's a lot of opportunity. And frankly, um, we don't go too far into the, the the planning stages because a lot of what we do comes from our partners, right? So having those conversations. So um, when we hear about like, here's the new challenge, this is the new thing that I need to focus on. These are the things that I'm worried about. Like that's, that's what's gonna drive us. Not so much like, hey, we have this whiteboard with all these grand ideas of all the things. I mean, you know, paper ideas are good, but it's like the people that are actually using um, and, you know, providing uh, the feedback are the ones that are driving where we're going. Yeah, okay. So right now today, you're another option for, bank and credit card transactions automate into the PSA and accounting system so that like you're not waiting on your money, right? Cash mm -hmm. is king. There was another part to that that you said was like the equipment financing or something like that. Let's talk about that in a second. But on the future, your goal is to like not just live at the end of the, the conversation, which is, am I getting paid? You mm -hmm. want to streamline into the entire life cycle of a transaction, right? Like streamline the full back office. So think of us as the back office solution for the MSP. Okay. All right. So, you know, probably, you know, you know, reporting, visibility, and automated some, some stuff, but there's probably some quoting in there or something. And <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going to put your words in your mouth, but like yeah. I'm just we'll, talking about what it takes we'll, to get we'll, from a cross those bridges when we get there. But for now, okay. yeah. all right, I may have stepped on something. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, so so talk to me about the equipment finance part. Then is that part of yeah. your story? So all yeah. So I'll make it clear. It's not equipment finance. So we okay. do partner with um, leasing companies to do traditional leasing. So okay. we we don't do leasing. Um, so like hardware leasing. What we focus on is the working capital. So less than a year. So like let's say. Uh, you have a client that has, let's say it's a new client, $10,000 onboarding fee, right? Um, generally speaking, as part of the sales process, that's a hard conversation to have, right? It's like, hey, you're going to you're gonna sign this managed service contract. And on top of this, we're going to charge you $10,000 up front to be able to scope everything out, make sure everything's so. So what our solution provides is you take that $10,000 invoice and you break it up into six monthly payments. So you pay that over six months, pay that over three months, pay that over 12 months without it affecting the MSP's cash flow. So MSP still gets paid up front. We're the one that fronts the money. We're the ones on the hook if the client doesn't pay. Um, and so that's just one use case. So think of it as really working capital financing. So anything from net 30, up to 12 months, doesn't have to be hardware related. Um, couple couple other use cases. So I'll give you an example of a partner of ours. So we had a partner um, out in Indiana, um, Patrick Kemp, I'm sure he, he, he'd love it if I mentioned him. But so Patrick and his partner were, uh, you know, they were growing, growing MSP um, and they were looking to go up market, right? So like they were going from like mostly SMB to more up market, mid market enterprise clients. So they had these opportunities to work with um, a, a regional franchise, so a coffee shop franchise. So across the board, you know, hundreds of locations across the Midwest. But the challenge there was because larger, more mid-market enterprise style uh, client, they required terms. So they were, you know, they were bidding for the preferred partner to install security cameras, all the infrastructure, every single location. And so, you know, you're growing MSP, you're getting started, you know, been around for a little bit, but you don't have access to, you know, $10 million line of credit, right? Um, so so uh, they partnered with us. And so um, what we have enabled them to do is every new franchise can now finance that project through us. So now the security camera installations, those uh, loca franchise location build outs, can all be financed through FlexPoint without it affecting our partners' cash flow. And so um, they grew revenue 
just to give you some numbers, they grew revenue over the course of eight months, 500% utilizing. Wow. Yeah. So we think of it as one, yes, we help you get paid. We automate the accounts receivable side of things, but we can also help you sell more, increase your client's wallet share, right? Like increase your client's purchasing power so they can do more with you, buy more from you um, without, you know, you obviously taking on the credit risk. Wow. That now, so that's interesting. That's different. That's new. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say that that's a huge, that's a great case study, by the way. I'm sure a lot of people would love to do that in their own businesses. Yeah, absolutely. But, but at the end of the day, like, you know, like to your point, a lot of people have decided, Hey, I, I just don't, I can't play over here because I can't mm -hmm. hold the 60 day terms. I can't, yeah. you know, float the money. Like, you know, I just, you know, that disrupts how the funk, the, the business runs, right? You know, based on the smaller guys. So to your point, like, yeah, I guess they could go and try and up, go to traditional banking and mm -hmm. see how far they're, you know, they can get with a line of credit or or, or that kind of thing. And and I'm sure, you know, the people are giving out money, at, I'm sure at a crazy high percentage, <laughs> but they're there, but up to a certain point, right? Like, right. you know? You know, like an unsecured line of credit, like you're probably not getting six figures without some sort of skin in the game, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had it. It's funny. We had a, a partner describe go, c coming to us. We we had a partner describe uh, what it felt like to them trying to get a line of credit from a bank. And the way he described it was like, I, I walked in there and I felt like I was naked, you know, like I had no clothes on because they asked me for you know, my last three years, financial statements, my mother's maiden name, everything. And on top of that, the personal guarantee, right? So ah, um, there is the personal and, guarantee. And so, whereas with FlexPoint, it's, you know, it's all in one place. It's all automated, seamless. We describe it as really a consumer-like experience, right? So if you look at um, things that are now like ubiquitous, like Klarna or like a firm, you go on the website, you click and you pay over three months. That's the type of experience we're trying to deliver um, okay. so that it becomes something that, you know, is that value add to both our partners and their clients. That's pretty cool. I love that story. So that that is a, a, a tool, one that many people don't have today, right? In order to make things go. And, and yeah, that goes back to what I was telling you. It's like, even today, right? Like we we are a new company. We are two years old. And even today, our goal when we launched was, yes, we provide you with the accounts receivable automation, the payment processing, but we wanted to provide something more out the gate. And so that's that's the something more that we're doing now. Um, but like I said before, we got we got a lot, a lot ahead of us. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, as a, as a guy that's been in the chair of trying to build new stuff, <laughs> I feel the pain. Yeah, it, you know, like sometimes it, you know it takes a lot. It's like building a building. Anytime somebody gave you a date, oh, the building will be open. It's like no, it won't. <laughs> right. This is gonna be a right. problem. It's gonna take Especially longer. in Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna take longer. It's gonna be weather. It's gonna be delayed. Permit. You know, the inspector didn't come. And you know, who knows, right? Like, so at the yeah. end of the day, like. Building stuff takes time. Building stuff well takes time. And then, like, I think one of the cool parts is, like, you know, getting feedback from your partners, your customers, so that you can ultimately, like, build the right stuff, to your point, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, I, I, I was, I mentioned this on the, on the last uh, episode. Uh, I was on my way back from Australia a couple weeks back, a few weeks back, and I was watching the Blackberry movie. I don't know if you saw it. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. And they were like, they were, they were talking about how like U.S. robotics put this modem order in. And then like, they were like, the it was a modem order that was never going to be like actually seen, right? They're like, right, right. you know, and actually it kind of hits your point, right? Like they, they had this like $15 million contract that they haven't made a single payment on. Right. And they're like running out of money. And so they called up U.S. robotics and were like, hey, what's going on? And they're like, oh, you didn't know we canceled that? <laughs> yeah. And the guy's like, what? Yeah, yeah. It turns out they were actually after, you know, like effectively the the other thing that these guys were building, which was what turned out to be BlackBerry, right? right and um, right. needless to say, they did not, you know, uh, capitulate and just hand over <laughs> the, the model, you know, the idea of their cell phone yeah. over, uh, over U.S. Yeah. robotics. But that being said, like, you know, had you know, if you remember in the movie, had the guy that they brought in as the CEO not gone to Verizon and make the pitch of his life. Right, like, right. Have Verizon to basically fund them. 
mm-hmm. probably go out of business. Yeah. Well, right, exactly. I mean, and that's the thing. They had to have them fund them. Otherwise, there's no way they could have done that. But yeah, it's, I mean, that's a challenge. I mean, I think it's a common challenge. We saw that on the other end, right? Like, that's part of why we did this. It's like, anytime you try to go up market, even if like today, right, like the majority of your clients are small businesses, even if you try to go like mid market, it's a whole different animal, right? Like you have different organization you have different stakeholders like even just getting paid is a whole different process right like there's a whole another level and so like if you don't have the right tools in place and the right plan in place to like be able to do that it's 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 really challenging so you you often find people not being able to take that next step because you know it's just not uh they don't have a plan in place yeah or or they they take a shot at it and they find out that 80 percent of their time is on client because they can't so it just takes a lot of energy to try and deal with somebody who's not the normal blueprint for you. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's another, it's another part of making sure you're, you're, um, I mean, we do this all on our end too, right? We see this all the time, like making sure your solution is, is well fitting for the type of client. And so sometimes you have to turn away clients that, you know, seem like a good, good uh, client, but at the end of the day, it would probably suck up a ton of resources. 100%. So that's cool. So you're a couple of years into FlexPoint. You know, sounds like you probably started with some cash, right, to get this thing going. So you mm-hmm. use all the skills that you you learned in your your VCPE days to like start a business, which is cool, by the way. Like, I think that's one of the you know, it's the Ameri- I call it the, the actual American dream, right? You can do whatever you want, <laughs> right? I mean, it's the it's actual not- American dream. My both yeah. my parents, uh, not not to get too uh too too into the. The weeds here but both my parents immigrants right so i'm first generation so there you go it's uh you know it's uh it, it's truly the american dream it is and uh as somebody who's you know you know come through that lens right like these people came you know with nothing in their pocket and they were just like hey we're just gonna work really hard and get the white picket fence yeah. and like live right nicely um there's more if you want it yeah a lot of people yeah. don't want it but there's <laughs> it is it is out there there's more yeah, yeah, well, it's, that's, that's it's true. Cool. I, I will say, you know, and I tell my kids this even now, like, uh, you know, hard work, it, it might not be what gets you there, but it's definitely not what's going to keep you from getting there. Yeah. So if you work hard and that's a constant. I, I, I like that line. I like that line. Yeah, no, if, if anything, I hate you go for it. If we have it recorded, this is good. <laughs> um, hard, hard work kind of gets you through the hard time i think right like that's the thing that like holds you over until you get to the magic that you hope to happen right so a lot of people don't put in the time right they you know and there and there's oodles and oodles of stories where people gave up too soon Mm -hmm. and -hmm. all of a sudden like you know you know something something happened to somebody in a similar position or something the per the next person in line you know hit it big right like here's a good one mcdonald's yeah right like that whole movie with Ray Kroc. Right, coming right, yeah. Like, yeah, it's like, a movie. yeah, it was great. The founder. Right. And I was like, those guys had a great idea and they got squeezed by a guy who was just hungry. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and there's a, I, I tell this to people as well. It's like, there, there's also a blind uh, uh, self-confidence, right? It's like, you, you take a look at me, right? It's like who most people that I went to law school with, right? Like, I, it's like, oh, the guy ended up running a business. Like it's, if you put yourself in those shoes, the, some might call it naive, right? Others might call it blind confidence, but you also have to have that part of it, right? It's like the hard work, but also like the belief that if you keep working hard, you will be successful. Mm -hmm. I agree. What, what your, your, your lawyer career wasn't like suits. Uh, Yeah, it was exactly like I'm just talking (laughs) about. I've never actually watched Suits. I get a lot of uh. You've never uh, watched Suits? No, no, no. I've never watched Suits. I've tried to. I tried actually. Now it's on Netflix. Like the whole like whatever fourteen seasons is on Netflix now. It's nine, but yeah. And uh, my wife is also a lawyer, so we we've, we've met in law huh. school, and so I I tried to convince her let's watch Suits, and she's like, oh, I can't watch that. It's like it's there's, there's too many things, right? It's like imagine watching a show you're an msp and you watch a, a show about being an msp right like you'll be like well that no that, that no no one uses that that's not how that works so it's not it's not the same well one it, it was very entertaining 
So if you do break down, if you I've heard, yeah, yeah, I've heard, yeah. <laughs> then you may have to come yeah. back to it. It's very good. And um, sounds like are you from like what, New York, New Jersey? I didn't catch where you're. I, I live in New York. I, I grew up in California. So, oh, okay. Well, you live in New York. So, suits yeah. is perfect for you because it's supposed yeah. to be based on New York. City. I did work in, in New York City, right? Like that. I did work at a law firm in New York City. Yes. Yeah. So, Eight, I, I, 82 hour weeks and, you know, for no money. Yeah. I would say 80, 80 hours on the on the low end. Yes. Was, uh, wow. So you just had a cot in your plate and you're in your cube and you just stayed. There. Uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, and this is getting probably too too in the weeds again. But um, there would be multiple weeks where you just work 90 to 100 hours a week. Wow. Um, and it's not it's like, you know, if the people think about it, especially I, I don't know. I mean, for anyone who's out there looking to become a, a corporate lawyer let's let's talk let's make sure you understand what that means but um but it's not it's it's not stimulating work right it's not sexy work you're generally what you're, you're doing buying people negotiating deals getting yeah, out of i wasn't i mean i was a i was a junior lawyer right like when you get to several years into it by now yeah sure I, i'd probably be doing the exciting stuff now but you know that'd be 15 years later um but yeah, in the early days, you're just grinding. You're just grinding. You're doing a lot of documents. You're doing a lot of review. You're looking at a lot of, you see a lot of things that, you know, you wonder, wow, how, how did this business get acquired for a billion dollars? But, you know, ultimately it's not your decision. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, uh, if I, if I didn't go into technology, Victor, I would have mm -hmm. tried to be a lawyer. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know yeah. if I would have been a good one or a bad one, uh, but uh, maybe I, I grew up watching too many lawyer shows. I don't know. Yeah, I think we all did, right? I think it's it's a it's a classic. You don't know what you're doing with your life, and so you heard that. Uh, you know, for me, it was like again coming back from the the immigrants background. It's like, well, I know that lawyers are a good profession, right? I'm I'm not going to be a doctor and accountant, and not blood or you know numbers. Um, Oh, but don't forget and there's an engineer, doctor, lawyer, engineer. Didn't you remember? Engineer, that was that was going to be too hard for me, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got Better. it. Well, one thing's for sure. I have uh, I've had a few more traffic tickets than the average guy or girl out there, but I drove a lot. So, you know, law of averages, in my opinion, I digress, but uh, I have bought many a traffic ticket and I would say I have a pretty good batting average. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, all right. That's it. As, as you know, one of the things is if you show up, right, that's you, you increase your chances 50 percent that you're going to you're going to win the traffic. Yeah. Except, except in Pennsylvania, I'll, I'll, I, yeah, this is a good story on the way out of here, but like Pennsylvania, they get paid overtime to show up to court. So by mm -hmm. the way, they have, they're, been, they're incentivized to show up. Okay. Yeah. For two, you know, we're one of the few states where the local police can't use like radar and speed guns. They got to use like really? the lights on the road and a stopwatch kind of thing. Uh-huh. Like, I yeah, it's silly. That's, I mean, really you know, my, my lawyer brain all of a sudden, ooh, there's a lot of there's a lot of loopholes there. <laughs> you would think, right? But they're like, oh, we got, you know, we, you know, we, we, the law says we have to calibrate our equipment every so many days, and here's the certification. Da, da, da. So I was like, yeah. okay, so I literally fought one of these where the lines on the road were like the police department went to Home Depot and like put them on themselves, right? Nobody mm -hmm. actually like surveyed these lines, right? And then like the road is on a curve, so the the lane one distance and the lane two distance aren't the same mm -hmm. and then like at the time i'd have to go back and look now and, you know and as i was reading through as a normal guy not from law school yeah. Uh, yeah. it was like hey the law said the the actual measurement of point a and point b have to be plus or minus one percent right like yeah. so if you measure yeah. this with like your car or some other instrument and then they go mm -hmm. to actually measure it you know normally what's mm -hmm. the calculation difference it's got to be within one percent right? right okay right. So I had um, I had had one where I was coming down this two lane highway in each direction, and I uh, I got clocked by a guy who said he was clocking me in his rear view mirror or like his side mirror, like the one where it says <laughs> objects may appear closer than like yeah. <laughs> legitimately. He says right. like writing, yeah. I clocked you in my mirror going eighty two point two miles per hour, making a right hand turn. Yeah, and I'm like. I, I'm not a, you know, like, a, you know, a scientist, but I'm pretty sure my Volkswagen doesn't turn right at 82.2 miles per hour. Right. I was like, and the and the roads backed up as traffic bumper to bumper. Did I fly over these cars? Like, I didn't know mm -hmm. I had a DeLorean with wheels that turned sideways. 
So anyway, long story short, just, <laughs> yeah, if anything, just a funny story on the way out the door. I went to Home Depot. I got a measuring wheel. I measured these lines. Oh, my God. Totally, totally unsafe on the side of the oh road. Oh, my God. And I was like, there's like 13 feet difference between yeah, yeah. who you say the measurement is and what the actual measurement is. And like, yeah. that's more than 1%, right? Yeah. yeah. So I go to court and they're like, well, your measuring wheel isn't a certified approved measuring. Like you didn't calibrate. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So uh, in Pennsylvania, we're one of, I think, three states where you can get a de novo trial just for free, right? You're just like, hey, yeah. I'm appealing. De novo, it. that's, a good, uh, that's yeah. a good legal world. Yeah. And um, I call up. PennDOT and I ask for the traffic engineer for like my area and I pay that person to come and survey the road like for real for real. and he got the same measurement I got created a report showed up to court to testify oh my god how I, much was the fine if can I ask you how much was the fine well, it was it was a five point license suspension 90 okay. days departmental okay. hearing like maybe you have to go back depending on the yeah, hearing big one. Like, yeah okay right, like you basically yeah. you can't move right yeah yeah okay All so right. i was like so like as a guy who is driving on some years like twenty five thousand miles a year my worst year like thirty eight thousand miles a year i drove like it was crazy wow. yeah just here in the northeast yeah. and i was i i need to drive to do what i do and so i fought it and um Jen's like these traffic violations starting to trigger me. <laughs> Jen, gotta, you got to do it on time. Don't be late. Anyway, so long story short, I, I ended up uh, doing well in that case. And so did yeah. uh, six months of my fellow Pennsylvania drivers who also got their cases reversed. So that's great. Oh, um, it, it became a uh, precedent. So other people could like point to I, it. Well, it's <laughs> it, well, it was the same officer who wrote. I'll look it up. Four. George Bardisi versus the state of. 444 tickets written by one guy on oh, one wow. time in six wow. months so like you tell me yeah wow well, that's congratulations i think i yeah. mean that's a it's an accomplishment there wow i just thought you'd find it funny as a guy who yeah you know, oh yeah no i mean I, we, we'd be on this for for several hours and probably not be able to do anything uh if if we started to get into stories about you know anytime i couldn't <laughs> use some of my you know legal skills into to making sure uh you know i'm not getting screwed over by somebody yeah well there's more of those stories but i don't want to trigger jen anymore victor where do people find more about flexpoint if they want to talk to somebody if they want to see something they're an msp where do they go yeah absolutely so just website so uh get flexpoint.com um and anyone feel free to reach out to me my email is just victor at get flexpoint.com Awesome. Well, I can't wait to trade more legal stories with you. It sounds like you have yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah. Guys, this none of this was legal advice. There's my, uh, there's my, uh, just my disclaimer. personal experience. It's just personal experience. <laughs> anyway, um, although Brad Gross is probably laughing at me somewhere. Yeah. Okay. I know. Anyway, um, this session was recorded, guys. Um, we're going to post it on all the podcasters, YouTube, uh, msbinitiative.com under sessions. Uh, MSP Community Wines next week in, in uh, Nashville. We got PAX 8 Beyond. We're doing a, a MSP block party there. We got Datacon Dublin. We're doing an MSP block party there. Register ahead of time. Yes, we'll be in the schedule on the conference apps, all that jazz, but like don't, you know, have to be one of those people that have to do it at the door. I digress. Victor, thank you very much. I'm sure I'm going to see you on the thank road, you. it sounds like. I'm sure. And, uh, I'll uh, see you at PAX 8. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. If it's not be, earlier, yeah. it'll be a great time. Well, that yeah. or in an airport somewhere for sure. It's yeah, like. absolutely. All right. All right, guys. Catch you on the next one. Thank see you. Yeah. Bye.